All right, folks, and we're live. Welcome to our NVIDIA stock analysis workshop. This is all part of our summer series in terms of how to apply fundamental professional analyst skills to determine if a stock is overvalued, undervalued, or should you simply avoid. Uh, for those of you that are part of our analyst program, this is just gonna give you more insight on how to apply your professional analyst skills when evaluating a stock. Uh, for those of you that are here for the first time, I hope this is going to give you an introduction into cash flow, discounted cash flow analysis, comparable company analysis, and again, give you more of a framework or methodology when it comes to evaluating stock like a professional. So with that being said, let's change screens here, and we can look at the agenda and at the materials that I've prepared for all of you. So let me share my screen. Here we go. Okay, so we're going to break this workshop in three sections. The first one is really to assess NVIDIA situation. What has happened with the stock? Um, what is the story behind the price performance? Let's put all of that into perspective so that we can have some context. And then let's dive more into the analysis portion, which would be what is the trading multiple is it overvalue versus the industry peers? Is it trading at a lower multiple when compared to, to the benchmark, uh, et cetera? Then the second part will be to answer the question, is it a buy or is it a sell? But there is a process to determining whether something is a, whether you should buy or sell something. And that is by performing preliminary valuation. And we're going to go through this exercise in the upcoming uh, tabs that I've laid out here on, on my spreadsheet. And then last but not least, talk a little bit more about analyst education. Why is it important and how all of the skills that we're really sharing in our program are not just for those that want to pursue a career in finance, investment banking, private equity, or hedge fund. These are really lifelong skills that you can apply to any other area of your professional career or even your own investment portfolio. As you graduate or as you're working, earning uh, money, you have a 401k, you have a savings account, and you want to use these skills to perhaps be a better investor, improve your rate of return, then you'll be able to apply all of these skills to, to have better judgment and make better investment decisions. So that's what I mean about these are live long uh, uh, skill set that you can apply to, to anything else that you're going to do. So with that being said, let's first take a look at the performance of NVIDIA, right? So one of the things that I like to do is look at a long-term time frame chart of any particular company, because the chart will tell a story. If we look at NVIDIA, over the past several months, right, from 2021, and if we zoom in a little bit more, let's change this to a weekly time frame, you can see that the stock essentially hit a high in Q4, okay, of 2021, right? This is known as the new tech bubble, right? Because as we had COVID, we had a massive influx of liquidity by the Fed, and also Congress, you know, they, they injected into the, in, into the economy in total anywhere between six to eight trillion dollars that had a multiple uh, effect in the overall economy. People that were staying at home, uh, they had money to, to speculate on the stock market, the professional sports gaming, all of that was shut down. So a lot of that capital went into the stock market. But as soon as the Fed realized that inflation was starting to pick up because of the decisions that they made, now we are in a rising interest rate environment. And this is the reason why most of the stock markets, specifically with technology stock, have declined in some cases 90% from their highs. With NVIDIA, you can see that the stock is approximately down 50% from their all-time high. So many investors now in real time, they're looking at the stock asking, is it time to buy? Is it at a bargain? Can we buy this stock and hold it for a year, two, three years, and maybe expect a return of 9, 10, 20, or 30% on a compounded annualized basis? So that's the question that we're here to answer. But the other thing that I would encourage you to do is to look at what happened before 2021. What was the stock performance before 
2021 and 2022, right? This boom and bust cycle, okay? Which continues to repeat himself over and over and over and over and over again in the stock market. It's just a natural sequence of event. We actually wrote an article about this uh, on our article feed in our website where we talk about the stock face model. And I'll share with you uh, what that really looks like to give you a little bit more context on how this works and what's the story behind these moves. But let's go a little bit back more. Let's increase our time frame here. And you can see that from 2009 to Q4 of 2021, NVIDIA stock was up more than 300%. This is a nice run up, as you can see right here. If we go back before 2019, look at this. The stock also experienced a major run up from 2016 to the middle of 2018. And then what happened? The stock declined another 50%. Okay. If we go back a little bit further, you can see that the stock was basically trading on a sideways range, right? From $9.75 on a split adjusted basis all the way to a low of $1.55. And again, this is all on a split adjusted basis. But for the good portion of about nine years, right? NVIDIA stock was basically just trading in this range, right? Right there in this range. And then something happened. There was an event that caused the stock to break and make new all-time highs right here. Now, again, this is all part of really understanding the story. And within our program, for those students that have access to our stock analysis content, all of the courses there, we've done research on approximately 57 high growth stocks. And we looked at several variables to help us better understand why would a stock make new highs and continue moving higher. And the variables that we paid attention to was revenue growth, earnings per share growth, the amount of capital inflow when a company announced earnings, meaning accumulation of stock by institutional investors. Those three were the main factors that we study. And we learned that a stock that has revenue greater than 20% over the course of three or four years has a higher likelihood of doubling in price after breaking out to new all-time highs. We have that entire study as part of our stock uh, uh, investing course. If you're in our analyst prep program, you have access to all of that. But what's important is to understand the story. Is sales growing greater than 20% over the next three to four years? Is earnings per share growing greater than 20% over the next three years? If those two are consistent with that story and they're both checks, then you have a very high probability that this stock will double or triple in price. And here you can see what happened, right? This stock just continued moving higher. And part of the story was that the fundamental part of their business, the gaming, the data center, uh, their professional uh, visualization segment of the business, and lastly, uh, uh, the autonomous driving section of the business, there were high demand for all of their products, right? Tesla with their uh, autonomous driving vehicle requires a certain type of chip or supercomputer in order to run high levels of data, high calculation in order to drive by itself. Well, who do you think manufacture the computer? It's essentially NVIDIA. So you had the back tailwind of a reemergence of a better technology with a lot of new innovation and the backbone behind all of that new innovation, perhaps providing a lot of the graphics, a lot of the computer chips uh, was basically NVIDIA. And that was the story behind why the stock broke to all time highs and continue rallying higher. Then it got to a point where we got into a major correction like we did over here in Q4 of 2018, right? The stock declined 50%, similar to what we experienced. But the long-term circular growth story was still intact, okay? And that forced new investors to come in, buy the stock, and made a new all-time high. And now you're seeing the same cycle. The stock is down 50%. Is this the bottom? Will NVIDIA make another major move to the upside like it did in previous cycles? Okay, if I zoom out of this, let's look at a monthly time frame, right? 
you can see that there's pattern structure to this, right? It goes up, comes down, retraces 50%, goes up, comes down, retraces 50%. And is, 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 are we poised to make another move to the upside? Well, that's the big question. If you're able to identify this and do it over and over and over again, over the course of 10 or 20 years during your career, you could definitely retire early. So this is where I said in the beginning that the skills that you learn as an analyst are lifelong skills. These are life skills that you should have, and you shouldn't just leave it up to the professional. It's about becoming a more intelligent investor. So I'm walking you through this process. So this is from a chart perspective and really understanding the story and kind of where are we right now? So with that being said, now let's look at some of the information that I actually like to look at to determine or help me understand is the stock overvalue or undervalue. So the first thing that I want to look at is comps, comparable company analysis. This is one of the concepts that we teach very carefully in our program, hedge fund analysts, investment bankers. They analyze comps to determine if the stock is uh, trading at a high multiple or at a low multiple. So here you have what Capital IQ considers competitors or close competitors to NVIDIA. NVIDIA is rep represented here on row number 28, okay? And we care about these metrics, revenue, EBITDA, and earnings per share multiple. From a business standpoint, when bankers are buying and selling companies, they buy and sell companies based on these multiples. The one that is perhaps most important for a company that is profitable and generating cash flow, it's EBITDA. Okay, so for those of you that have aspiration to someday work in a private equity firm, when you're buying and selling companies, that's what you're going to be focusing on, the EBITDA multiple. If you are planning to someday work at a venture capital firm or be an entrepreneur and raise money at some point, the multiple that you're going to be paying very close attention will be revenue multiple. And of course, your annual recurring revenue, ARR. So those are the metrics that you can become familiar about depending on what career path or discipline you want to, to be part of. So now that we have all of these competitors here and we have a basic understanding of these comps, look at the mean and median. So this is our benchmark, the mean and median. Is NVIDIA trading above or below sales? Well, they're trading above sales. They're trading above EBITDA. And they're definitely trading above PE, right? We can put right here premium or discount, right? And we can simply calculate this. Let's use the median as our benchmark. So I'm going to take the current multiple of NVIDIA divided by the median minus one. Drag this across. And this will kind of give you, okay, let's see here if I can change this to eight, okay, and let's center this. So right now I'm just simply formatting. There we go. And let me see if I can put this here, there, and let's remove these. So you can see that NVIDIA on a sales multiple basis is trading 100% above the median. On an EBITDA basis, it's trading 123% above the industry median, and it's trading 57% above the industry P multiple. Now, I want to make this session or this workshop a little bit more engaging. Just based on this analysis that I share with you, do you think NVIDIA is overvalued or undervalued, giving their multiple where they're trading at right now? Simply type yes or no. And I want to make this a little bit more engaging. I want you guys to, to participate, ask questions, and you know, I'll be more than happy to, to share my, my answer. But what do you think? The question is, is NVIDIA overvalued or undervalued? Just simply looking at those three metrics, sales, EBITDA, and PE multiple. What do you guys think? Okay. I see. I'm not going to say the, my, my, my response yet until I get all of you guys' participation. Okay, I, I, I see it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay. <laughs> all right. So I, so I see here a, a, a few... Um, mix, overvalue, undervalue, uh, neutral, fairly undervalue. Okay, so, so, so it's a, a mixture. Now, here's where we're going to take it a step further to really understand this, right? Because this is just one side of the picture. We need the other side of the picture, which is more financial metrics. We need to understand, is NVIDIA more profitable than every one of those other companies? Is NVIDIA growing faster than its peer group? Why is the market paying 
a premium on sales EBITDA and PE multiple versus its industry peers, right? So we need to understand their level of free cash flow generation. How profitable are they really? So I had that information already here and I was hiding the columns. So let me unhide the columns and here it is, right? So here we're looking at gross profit margin, EBITDA margin and EBIT margin. And you can see that on a gross profit margin, they're more profitable than the median of the industry. On a EBITDA margin basis, okay, they're a little bit more in line with the median, but on an EBIT margin basis, they're more profitable. So the company's generating more free cash flow on a dollar basis than everyone else on the industry, okay? Now, the other component that I like to really look at is growth, net income growth or earnings per share growth. Look at the median. Okay, it's 36%. Look at NVIDIA, 77.5%. We can round this to 79 or 80%, okay? There's a few outliers here. This one of 268% and this one up here, Micron. If we remove those two, then you know that the medium is about 36%. So NVIDIA is not only more profitable than its peer group, they're also growing faster than the peer group. Therefore, the market is paying a premium for NVIDIA because of their uh, uh, strong financial profile. They have a better financial profile than their industry group. So this is how you interpret or read a comparable company analysis or a comp table like I'm illustrating right here. This is very, very important because we're gonna use these numbers, these multiples to come up with a reasonable price target for NVIDIA. Is it below 150? Or is the new price target above 150? And that's part of the exercise where you apply valuation, all right? Any questions on this before I move forward? I wanna make sure that you guys are understanding some of these concepts if you're hearing it for the first time. If you're part of our analyst program, you should already be familiar with all of this because we cover this in module number two, comparable company analysis, okay? None? All right, so let's move forward. Now, the next part is to really understand the historical multiple of NVIDIA on a sales and EBITDA basis. So remember I said that from an investment banker standpoint, they buy and sell companies on a sales or EBITDA basis. If you're in private equity, if you're going to buy a company, you're going to be paying very close attention to the EBITDA multiple. So over the last 10 years, what has been the sales and EBITDA multiple of NVIDIA? Right? What, what does that multiple chart looks like? So that's what we have here under historical multiple tab. And I calculated this information for you. So the one that you're seeing right now on my screen is total revenue. You can see up here the legend, right? Total revenue. So we have the high of 34.8. We have the median of 8.1. And then we have the low multiple range of 0.88. Look at the high of the sales multiple in Q4 of 2021. Look at this high, 34.8, 34.8. So imagine the group of investors, which is usually retail, where they're not as sophisticated as the buy side, someone working at a hedge fund, at a private equity firm, uh, or at an investment bank. These are usually retail investors that are not experts and focus more on FOMO, emotion, and what the media is talking about, right? Many retail investors were buying NVIDIA at 34 times sales. Like, this is insane, right? You're overpaying for a product. Look at the multiple now, 12.5. That's the sales multiple. We're as it stands right now today, 12.5. So this is a huge haircut. The same way the stock price is down 50%, well, you're getting to see it right now on a sales multiple basis. Now, the question of many investors is, is there more room to the downside to NVIDIA stock or the overall stock market? There is an investment strategy known as mean reversion, where the stock will eventually revert back to its mean or median, as you're seeing right here. So can NVIDIA come down on a sales multiple basis to 8.2? The answer is yes. Is it likelihood? 
Well, it depends. It depends if the Fed will continue to increase rates, which is part of the macro environment that NVIDIA doesn't have any control over. Okay. It also depends on government policy. And if things continue the way they're going, higher inflation, higher interest rates, um, higher taxes on the federal level, well, you're putting all of the pieces in place for another leg down in the overall market, which means NVIDIA could come down to 8.8, okay? So that's mean reversion. Um, can it come down all the way to its historical low over the last 10 years of 0.88? I think it's very unlikely, given that the company is still growing revenue. And I'm going to share what that looks like. But these are part of the, these are clues or information that you need to have when you're making investment decision, okay? I mean, buying a stock 34 times sales, it's just extremely, extremely expensive. And this is one way to look at that. So this is on a total revenue, uh, enterprise value or a total revenue standpoint. So this is the multiple that I really care about. And I can see that back in 2018, the stock went below its median uh, sales multiple. Can we experience that again and maybe give us a really good opportunity to buy a, a growth stock, best of breed in their industry group and buy it at a, at a discount and then ride the next way to the upside. Okay, so this is also part of, of, of using fundamental analysis to really buy a stock at the right time and then hold it for two, three, four years and leave it in your portfolio. Okay, now the other metric that I care about is EBITDA. So on the right side, I've calculated right here the EBITDA multiple for NVIDIA. And you can see here on the legend, we're looking at EBITDA. On an EBITDA basis, the high was 88 times. On a medium basis, the multiple is 26 times. And then their historical low over the last 10 years is 4.3. Can we get in a scenario or situation where their current EBITDA multiple goes below the median from the last 10 years? The answer is yes. And if the stock continues to decline, then this multiple will also continue to decline. Have we found a bottom in the overall market? I don't think so. Um, and there's other factors, technical indicators that I look at, which I'm gonna put that into perspective um, after we do the preliminary valuation on, on NVIDIA. Okay, so these two charts right here are very important. And usually, Retail investors do not have access to this information. So retail investors in many cases could be at a disadvantage because of misinformation, because they don't have access to um, this type of data. So very important to understand these trading multiples as well, okay? Uh, let's see, I have a question in here from Sheldon. Uh, for the mean reversion strategy, how far back do investors look in a firm's public historical to calculate the average? Um, is there a rule of thumb? Show them that, that that's a good question. So you have to consider the audience. Who is the person doing the analysis? If it's a retail investor, you could probably look at five years or 10 years. If it's a company like a private equity firm that is looking to buy the business, they'll probably look at 20 years, right? Um, how long has this company be, been public? I want to see their trading multiple over that long-term period. Because if I'm going to buy this company, I don't want to buy the company at 88 times EBITDA. That is extremely expensive. I would rather buy the company, right? Somewhere around maybe 15 times, right? I would rather buy this company at 15 times EBITDA. I will feel more comfortable paying 15 times EBITDA for this business if I'm going to buy the company outright. That's from a private equity standpoint. From an investment banker standpoint, if they're helping the buyer or their seller with this transaction, they'll probably look at 10 or 20 years, depending on how, uh, uh, on the amount of time the company has been public. So I hope that gives you a little bit more um, insight on your question, but it really depends on the market participant. Is it a private equity investor? Is it a hedge fund investor? Is it a, a mutual fund investor? Is it an investment banker or a retail investor? right? Depending on which hat you're wearing, the amount of time that you may want to look at, it, it, it depends. It varies, okay? So it's really about applying judgment and, and it depends. So I hope that answers your, your question, okay? All right, good. You're welcome. All right. 
Okay, so now that we understand NVIDIA sales and EBITDA multiple historically, okay, how do we use this information to, to value the stock, right? But before we value the stock, let's pay close attention to their financial profile. Remember that on a comp basis, NVIDIA is trading at a premium because they have a better profitable profile or better financial profile than its industry group or most of them. Now let's look at the growth of NVIDIA over the next three years. So what I'm illustrating right here is essentially their PL or their income statement. Here you have total revenue, gross profit, EBITDA margins, EBIT, net income, and earnings per share. Look at the level of growth after 2020, okay? Look at this. The stock grew in 2021, 52%. Then in 2022, 61%. Then on an LTM basis so far, the stock is up. Well, the financials of the company is up 53% on an LTM basis. And in their next fiscal year, 2023, they're expected to grow at 25%. Then the following year, 2024, they're expected to grow at about 15.9%. And in 2025, they're expected to grow at 13.3%. Okay, so you have a company that after 2022, they're going to grow revenue. Even though we might be already in a recession, in a rising interest rate environment, NVIDIA is still growing. So that is a positive sign for the business. Look at the gross profit margin. They're improving. They're slightly improving, right? If we look back historically, 61% in 2019, 62%, 63%, 64% on an LTM basis, 65%. So they're getting more efficient in terms of their business operations, which tells me that they're probably generating more free cash flow than their competitors, which is a good positive sign for investors that are using a discounted cash flow valuation method. Okay. Look at EBITDA right underneath. Mm, ah, okay. EBITDA declined in 2023 on an LTM basis, 42%. Okay, but it recovers in 2024, but then it comes down in 2025. So I would like to understand why this is happening. Why do you have an uptick and then a downtick in EBITDA margin? So this could be a number of factors. This could be stock-based compensation, options that are going to be exercised. Uh, this could be depreciation. Either they're accelerating it or they're going to decrease it. This could be uh, change in accounting reporting uh, format. So multiple factors, and usually you will read a research report. All the research analysts, that is their primary job to really forecast these numbers at a very detailed level. They'll write a research report, and then they'll give you explanations as to why these numbers are increasing or decreasing. Then lastly, EBIT. Look at EBIT, 47, 49, and 49%, which I like. And then net income as a percentage of revenue also increasing over time from 40, wow, 30, uh, 36, 32, then 40%. This is good. I like these numbers. So the financial profile picture of NVIDIA going forward is positive. Um, I like it. So now how do we use this information to really value the stock? So the preliminary analysis that I put together, okay, is using sales multiple valuation. So sales multiple valuation simply says that based on the sales growth of your company, you can apply a sales multiple and then solve for revenue. So how do, how do we do that? Well, quite simple. We have at the top row seven, our revenue growth numbers, okay? You got to see this on the previous tab. Then number two, what is a reasonable multiple to pay for that revenue growth. On row 15, you'll notice that I have 8.2 as my sales multiple. Where am I getting that 8.2? Where that 8.2 comes from my historical median of sales multiple over the last 10 years. That's this right here. That's how I'm calculating that number. So eventually, they should revert back to their mean. And that will be 8.1. So if at some point NVIDIA gets to trade at an 8.1 or 8.2 EV over sales multiple, then what would be the implied price, share price? And that would give me a price target. 
So let's back solve this. So how do we do this? Okay. First, we calculate our enterprise value. Just take the multiple, multiply that by your estimated revenue on that given year. That gives you the enterprise value of the business. Okay, right here, we're estimating, let me format this properly. There we go. Right here, we're estimating $275 billion. We can drag this across to the right and you can see what the implied enterprise value will be by year 2025. Just simply take the multiple, keep the multiple constant and multiply it by your revenue. The next thing is to account for cash and equivalents that the business has. We got to extrapolate that. Where do we get cash and equivalents? Well, you can go to the SEC filing, look at the most recent quarterly report, go to the balance sheet, cash and equivalents, and you can get the number from there. I already have that number from Capital IQ. And here is the level of cash that the company has, 20.3 billion, and the amount of total debt that they have on their balance sheet, 11.8 billion. So let's adjust these two numbers to get our implied equity value. So I'm just going to do equals minus our cash and short-term investment. And we're going to add our total debt of 11.8 billion. I'm going to change this to green because in the industry, green numbers are links. Okay, so all of these are links. Green, there we go. So here's their net debt. Here is their implied equity value, which I'm essentially just saying my enterprise value minus my net debt, okay? And then we're gonna buy, divide our equity value by their shares outstanding. 2.5 billion shares is what they have. Let's link this across the board. Change this to green because green are links. There, and then we divide our equity value Divide that by our shares outstanding, and this gives you an implied share price. The current stock price of NVIDIA right now, as of the close of July 13th, is $150. Look at the implied share price that I'm getting right now. If the stock reverts back to its mean, it has more to move to the downside, potentially 25% if we're using 2023 numbers. If we're using 2024, it has a potential 13% to the downside. So we're probably not done, okay? And then if we do a discount factor on row number 24, if we discount the share price, the price target that we arrive right here by 10%, then you can see the discounted share price, which means more potential pain, more potential downside on the stock. But the main driving variable here is this, is your sales multiple. This is the main variable. So let's play devil advocate here. What do you guys think should be the sales multiple for NVIDIA when you account that the company is gonna be growing 25% in 2023, 16% and 13% within the next uh, two to three respective years. So revenue growth is still gonna be double digit. So do you think that the sales multiple should perhaps be double digit as well? Instead of eight, maybe should be what the company, where the company is currently trading at today, which is around 12 times. What do you guys think? Give me a multiple. And then we'll, we'll add it here to our preliminary sales valuation. And then we'll get to see what is a potential share price. So that's the big factor right there. And in valuation, the biggest challenge in valuation is coming up with reasonable assumptions, number one. And number two, really understanding the growth story of the business. Those two are the most um, difficult and challenging part uh, that an investment banker or, or, or a hedge fund investor has to come up with when they're valuing a, a, a stock. So what do you guys think from a multiple standpoint? What should it be? Okay. And while you're thinking about that, let me go back to comps. Look where they're currently trading at right now. Right now, they're trading at 12.5 times. And the median was about what? 8.2 historical med uh, median over the last 10 years is 8.2. So should they be trading at 12.5, giving their revenue growth, their profitability, their earnings per share growth, the positive financial profile picture that the company has? What do you guys think? What should be the multiple? 
Okay, I see some answers coming in. Mm -hmm. Okay. I'll probably take the average of, of what you guys are, are typing in right now. <laughs> okay. All right. All right. So for, for the most part, I'm seeing here 12 and a half. So let's apply a 12 and a half multiple to NVIDIA and let's see what price target we get. So let's, I'm just going to hard code this. So 12.5 and look at the new share price that we get on row 22. Look at the new share price, $171 a share. If you hold it to 2024 and they do trade at a 12.5 sales multiple that year, you're looking at a share price of $198. And if you hold it for three years and wait for 2025 sales, if the stock trades at a 12 and a half sales multiple, then you're looking at a share price of $224. That's a 49% upside from where it's currently trading at right now. Okay. But the main driver here, is this, is your EV over sales multiple, okay? So from a preliminary standpoint, this is the type of return that you can expect on NVIDIA over a three-year period, probably 49%, assuming that the market ends up paying 12.5 times sales, okay? So I believe that this is more on a conservative basis. I think 12.5 times um, sales multiple on NVIDIA, given how their financial profile looks like, might be maybe the base case, okay? Now, what will be the upside case? So remember, you know, in, in, in finance and in investing, you're really in the probability business. So you have a base case, you have a, 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 a bear case, and you have a bull case, right? So what are the multiples under each one of these cases? So on the base case, I'm assuming 12.5 times. Let me change the format here real quick. There. Okay. On a bear case, this would be reverting back to the industry median. On a bull case, we can say that the stock would probably trade at a 25 times uh, sales multiple. So this is EV over sales. Okay. And this is scenario or cases. There we go. So let's play through this. Uh, let's see. So we can do a quite a very simple um, choose or offset function to, to, to change this. Uh, let's see if we could put our here case. Okay. We're going to maybe put that there and change this to one. And let's change this here to that function. So let's see, choose. Okay, from here, if this equals, let's say, one, choose this one, and choose this one. Let's see if I'm using the correct choose function. Let's see, two, three, nope, got to change that index function. Uh, let's see, equals, choose. from my first case, my second case, and my third case, would this work? Okay, so let's see, one, two, three. Okay, so I'm, I'm using essentially the choose function to make my model or my analysis a little bit more dynamic. So if I'm using case number one, it's what? My base case. Number two is what? My bear case. And number three is my bull case. And I'm just gonna change the font style to Great. There we go. So now you can run this analysis. If you think that two years from now, the Fed is going to lower interest rates because we enter into a recession and the economy needs some sort of uh, kickstart or monetary policy to encourage investment from corporations to spend more, hire more people, and again, reignite the engine of growth in the economy. If you believe that scenario will happen two years from now, then there might be a situation where the stock will trade at 25 times. That is in a declining or decreasing interest rate environment, which is not what we have right now. But in that scenario, that is case number three, 
right? That's my bull case. Then look at the share price of, then look at the price target. Look at this, the stock will more than double. If we're looking at 2025, a three-year holding period, you're looking at a potential stock price of $445. That's 195% uh, uh, increase on the stock. That is my bull case. Decreasing interest rate environment, uh, more loose monetary policy from the Fed, and maybe the federal government is more accommodative to a pro-business environment, right? So that's my investment thesis for the bull case. That's one scenario. My bear case is where the Fed will continue to increase interest rates over the next 12 months, and we are still faced with inflation of 8%. In that scenario, case number two, look at this, we still have more downside. We still have more downside to the stock. So I, I will not be buying this stock right now. And my base case is the Fed has paused temporarily their rising rate cycle. They've paused it. They've managed to get inflation under control. In the next several months, inflation begins to decline. And we might see an environment where NVIDIA could potentially still maintain their 12.5 EV over sales multiple. That's scenario number one. And what do we have? We have a potential price target of $224 a share three years out, which is 49% upside from here. It's up to you to test your thesis and determine which one of these three scenarios is more likely to happen. I could be wrong. Many professional investors are wrong all the time, but it's about risk management. It's about closing your losing positions quickly. Take a step back, reevaluate, look at the big picture and try to understand what did you miss? What blind spot, what piece of information would you not account and accounting for? And then reevaluate, go back to the drawing board and update your investment thesis. And then once you reevaluate, you can come back and take another position, whether it's to the upside, whether it's to the upside by being long the stock, or if you're bearish to the downside by shorting the stock. Um, that's a little bit more of, of sophisticated investing, especially for those that are working at a hedge fund or more professional traders. You could go long and you can go short, uh, depending on whatever the in, uh, market environment you might be in. Okay, but I hope this gives you a very simple but practical and advanced process to evaluating a stock and simply using sales multiple. This is very basic, folks, but it's also sophisticated the way I'm sharing it. I'm trying to simplify this as much as possible. Now, to really put it into perspective, if you really want to see what it really takes to do a full-blown analysis like this one, which is what our students are doing in the analyst program, here's what they do. Here's a full-blown financial model on, let me increase the iteration. This is a full-blown financial model on NVIDIA that was put together by one of our interns. Here's the income statement. This is a 10-year model, folks. Here is the balance sheet, okay? Here is the cash flow statement. Here is the debt schedule that this intern put together after completing our program as part of our internship. Take a look at the different scenarios. He ran across the model. He ran a Wall Street case, a bullish case, and a bear case, okay? He also accounted for different uh, multiple valuation for each one of the cases, okay? He had his own depreciation schedule, okay? Calculating depreciation and amortization for, for this company. He had his own revenue buildup, okay? Comp analysis, comparable valuation, Right, so he's using several metrics, EBITDA, sales, and PE multiple. Right, so three different types of multiple analysis to come up with his price target. And here you can see it, right, right here. You can see the different types of valuation ranges that he received and where he believes the stock should be trading at. Then he performed a discounted cash flow analysis. Right, he did terminal EBITDA method, and the perpetuity method. And then finally, he combined all of his methodologies, all of the different types of valuation ranges to ultimately come up. And let me clear this. 
So it's a little bit easier for you to see there. Then he has the low valuation range and the high valuation range. Um, there's no exact numbers in finance, right? This is more art than science. And this is where he believed the stock should be trading at. Between 170, if, and if we focus on the median, between 179 and 290, okay? Which means that at a current level where the stock is around $150, on both cases, the low and the high range, the stock is undervalued, right? The stock is essentially undervalued. If we plot the chart right here, okay? And we draw out the ranges that he believed the stock should be trading at. Let me adjust the settings here, right? And put it side by side. So what is his range uh, that he has? So he has from 186 to $299, okay? So that would be from about here to close to 300. Okay, so this is where the stock should be trading at based on his analysis, which means that Nvidia can bounce and it should be trading within this area, okay? Giving all of his, giving all of his calculation, right? He performed a discounted cash flow. He built the three statement model. He calculated the free cash flow of the business. And he also performed comparable company analysis, all of the methodologies. And this is where the stock, according to him, the stock should be trading between 186 and close to 300 if, if we really round this area right here, okay? And compare that to what I have. Compare that to my preliminary analysis, assuming simply just the base case, right? The stock could be trading at, let me put this here side by side. Okay, there it is. So, 2025, three years out, assuming the base case, 12.5 sales multiple, an implied share price of 224. Yeah, we'll bring the stock right around here, right from here. It can increase it right up there and it represents a 49% upside. So giving this analysis, I do think that Nvidia is undervalued. The market has punished the stock severely. However. However, is this the time to buy? Can the stock continue to move lower and become cheaper? The answer is yes. So a lot of this is market timing. Remember that I said at the beginning that there are other technical indicators that I use to give me a better buying opportunity. Essentially, when should I buy the stock? And I keep it very, very simple. Notice here on this chart that I'm illustrating, Notice that I have a red moving average line, right? This is the 200 day moving average line, which is usually used by institutional investors uh, at the mutual fund side, the traders that are taking big positions. They pay very close attention to that moving average line. If it's above it, we're in a bullish cycle. If it's below it, we are in a bearish cycle. Now take a look at this over the last 20 years and look at the two cycles of the stock, right? See the first cycle right here? It's above it, right? So you could go long this stock. Then, see here? It's under it. You avoid the stock. You do not want any piece of this, right? When would be another time to re-enter? You could do all the analysis that we just went through and even go a lot more in depth the way our, our analyst students do. And you can re-enter the stock when it comes right back, right above it, like it did right here. And it gives you another opportunity to write it to the upside, okay? It's underneath now, so you avoid the stock. Let's look at another example on another company so that this becomes a little bit more clear and it reinforces what I'm trying to explain to you. Here's Apple, right? Look at Apple and pay very close attention to those moving average lines. Let me clear my drawings because we were doing some analysis here with, with, with other students from our program, and we can come over here. Okay, there it is. Can you identify the pattern? Can you see it? Below the 200-day moving average line, you avoid it. Above it, you can reassess the stock, do your fundamental analysis, 
build your discounted cash flow, perform comparable company analysis, understand the situation overview, build your scenarios, and come up with your investment thesis. And then give it time. Let time work on your side. So here, after the dot-com bubble, look at this. The stock basically just declined. Then right around 2003, when they released their first iPod in 2003, look at this. The stock began a new move to the upside. Goes up, retraces to the 200-day moving average line. Finds support. Institutional investors see this. This is a long-term secular growth story. Look at the financials. Our revenue growing double digit on the pullbacks. Then it moves higher again. Then another correction. Institutional investors are looking at this. Is it another opportunity to buy the stock? Then it rises up again. Then it comes down. Then during this cycle, during this period, what, what did we have? We had the housing crisis. We had the financial crisis. That's why the stock dipped again below the 200-day moving average line. But then look here. It recovered in 2009. A lot of stimulus from the Fed, a lot of help from, from uh, uh, Congress and, and the new administration that came in uh, into the presidency back in 2009. And then we have a new bull cycle. See, look at it. Keep following it. Comes down. You avoid it. Stay away from it. Do your fundamental analysis. See again? It's over it. Now you do your fundamental analysis. Now you give this a... Uh, 12 to 24 months holding period and you ride the next cycle. See here again, comes down, right? You avoid it, wait until it goes above it. Then you do your fundamental analysis and you give it 12 to 24 months holding period to uh, let the trade or your investment thesis materialize. See, it keeps happening over and over and over. So right now, I'm outside of the market. I'm not really participating with any positions, not yet because I'm waiting for companies like NVIDIA to recover, to regain or stay above the 200-day moving average line. Take a look at Shopify, one of the biggest winners of the previous cycle that we had. Look at this. See how it's below it? I'm avoiding this stock. But I like Shopify. I like the business model. I like the growth story, but I'm just waiting. Look at the same scenario with Amazon, which is one of the best performing stocks in the last decade. Look at this. Let's go back. See here, right? After the dot-com bubble of 2000, underneath the 200-day moving average line. No need to be a hero. No need to buy it. Once it came back above it in 2000, okay, maybe you could trade it or buy and hold it for 12, 24 months. Let time work on your favor. Then it moves up again. Then it comes down, zigzag. Then it breaks above the 200. Then you can test that thesis again. Okay, it came back down. Not a problem, but you have to reevaluate your thesis and story. But once these stocks power higher and they start their long-term trajectory move to the upside, this is where you can make significant gains in your portfolio. But you have to understand the process. I'll share one thing with you, and, and I keep seeing this in the public, and I keep seeing this from a lot of other people. You know, They say, oh, buy an index, buy the S&P 500, buy the mutual fund. Well, it's because many of these individuals, they're not stock pickers. They don't understand stock analysis. They don't understand the cycles. They don't understand how to evaluate uh, uh, stocks that issue above market returns. For those of you that are in our analyst prep program, the stock investing course, I very clearly showcase 56 examples on what to pay attention and what to look for. That is my edge or that's the edge of everyone in our community when we're looking at high growth stocks that will perform above average uh, or above the market. Perfect example was Amazon. And you can see it. You can see it when they regain the 200-day moving average line. If they're growing revenue over 20% for the next three, four, five years, the longer, the better. If it's a decade like Amazon, then you expect you're looking at a stock that can potentially grow by a factor of 10x. 10x is 10 times your money. And right now we are in a bearish cycle. But when we regain the bull market cycle and technology stocks are back in favor, you better know this methodology because if you don't know it, you're going to make a lot of mistakes and you're going to lose the next five or 10 years. Um, and I'm telling you from experience because when I first started, I did not understand any of this. When I was in your shoes as a college student, 
I started just by reading books and the books actually, you know, complicating things more than what they should have. Because one thing is reading it. The other one is doing it, understanding it and having a decade of experience, seeing and experiencing these market cycles over and over and over again. So what I'm sharing you are things that I've already experienced over a decade. And for those of you that are in our community, this is what we're going to be doing. So when I start buying stock, I'm going to share with you guys. And of course, there's another uh, uh, tool that I use, and that's options. Um, in the last session that, that we did this uh, workshop series, we were looking at Zoom. We saw how, how high uh, the options on Zoom uh, increase over a, a 12 or 24 months period. It, it was something like 70X, 7,000%. Whereas the stock increased about 500%, the options increased by, I think, six or seven times more the stock. So those are the type of ideas and, and investment opportunities that I'm trying to explain and teach you guys so that when the time comes where tech is in favor again, when the Fed is lowering interest rates because they need to reignite the, the engine of growth in our economy, we're going to be ready. We're going to be ready. But for now, it's about developing your skill set. It's about studying and understanding this process. All right. Um, the last part that I'll mention is where can you learn more of this? For those of you that are watching you know, um, our, our webinar and are firstly introduced to Romero Mentoring, you know, go to our website. Um, what I'm sharing right here right now, this is our own community feed. We have our own social platform. In addition, okay, in addition to our own training courses, right? We have 25 courses in all on this platform. Remember I was talking about the stock investing course for those of you that are part of the analyst prep program, you have all of that right here. Our alpha stock investing strategy, module number three. Here it is. Here it is, right? Here's the study and the analysis that I've put together. I mean, I can basically raise capital and use this to start a hedge fund, right? But we're here because I want to build the community. I want to teach you guys all of the things that we've learned so that when the time comes, you can identify stocks when they break out and you can experience these type of returns over a 12 or, or 24 months time frame. Okay, so we have all of the analysis, all of the studies available for you on our platform. Um, and of course, for those of you uh, in the analyst prep program, we have access, you have access to all of our mentors as, as well if you wanna pursue a career in finance. Uh, where do you find our entry level courses? Right here, just go to our website, starter programs, here they are. You have the Investing Analyst Essentials, the Business Essentials Program, and the Finance Success Track. So it's up to you to spend the time, spend the, uh, 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 the necessary or make the necessary effort to elevate your skill set so that you can do this type of analysis that I'm sharing with you. Okay. So with that being said, folks, now you understand what my take on NVIDIA. I think it's undervalued. It's undervalued. But is now the right time to buy? No, I will wait for the stock to trade above the 200 day moving average line. And then I could come back, reevaluate these numbers so that I can have a uh, more up to date share price. That might be six months from now. That might be three months from now. Okay. But you actively have to continue filing the stocks and then come back and look at this analysis. All right. All right, folks, um, I'll open it up to any questions. We have uh, a couple of more minutes left, and then we'll wrap this up. Uh, let's see here. I have another question. Sheldon, if you wait to buy it, uh, if you wait to buy in after the stock price crosses the 200-day moving average line to the upside, wouldn't you be behind the market? What are some leading technical indicators used for timing? Sheldon, that's a good question. And look, the, the, the simple answer to your question is, yeah, absolutely. Look, no one's going to capture the bottom, right? <laughs> I got burned many times in my earlier days trying to capture bottom. But when it crosses the 200 moving average line, you rather wait for confirmation and maybe ride the stock for the next 24 months where it might increase 200%, three, 400%. So in reality, you're really not missing anything, right? If we go back, and look at Amazon, right? Look at Amazon. Specifically, from 2014 uh, to 2015, right? 
look at all this period. This is about seven, eight months, right? Let's say about eight months where the stock just traded sideways. Your money wasn't doing anything. You could have had better positions that were actually moving to the upside during that market environment. But after they crossed the 200-day moving average line to, to the upside and then broke resistance on the old-time high, you could have bought the stock. And then look, you could have experienced major move to the upside. So this is my point. You're not missing anything. Don't try to be the first one in. Don't try to catch a falling knife. Don't try to catch your, uh, um, a bottom. And the reason why I'm able to say this is because I've already seen these examples over and over and over again over a decade long of market experience. So I'm not worried right now, right? Look at NVIDIA. I'm not, I'm not buying this right here. I'm not. If you want to be more tactical, that's another way of doing it. If you want to be tactical, let's say you want to buy a thousand shares, right? Do not put a thousand shares right here. Maybe buy a hundred, buy 10% of your entire position. You could buy a hundred here. Maybe if it comes down to this level of support, you could buy another hundred. So now you have 20% of your entire position that you accumulated under the 200 day moving average line. But once it regains the 200 moving average line, then you can buy the remaining 80% of the position. That is more tactical. That is known as scaling in. Personally, I don't like to do that because I don't like to tie up my capital on positions that are not moving, that are not favorable to me. I want all of the indicators and market momentum on my favor, on my side. Okay. But it also depends on your personality, right? In, in, investing and developing a strategy also has to be consistent uh, or, or uh, um, adaptable or suited. It's a better word. Suited to your personality. And, and that takes time. You need to know uh, yourself very well, your emotions uh, very well. Um, if, if you're going to you know, buy a stock that is below the 200-day moving average line because you think it has um, bottom, I, I try not to play that game. Um, but I hope that kind of gives you some context and some explanation on how you can do it. Buy 100 shares, maybe 200 shares. Wait after it crosses the 200-day moving average line, and then you can buy the remaining, uh, your remaining position size, let's say 800 shares, and now you have 1,000 shares left. Um, but I will not go all in on a stock that's below the 200-day moving average line. Why? Because you don't want to be stuck in positions like this, right? Look at this. Look at this thing, right? I, you do not want to be in these type of positions. And there's many stocks during the last bubble that we experienced that are not going to come back. They're, they're just dead. They're not going to come back above the 200-day moving average line. So know what you own. Profitable companies that are growing revenue, double digits, that have positive free cash flow. And if they have a share buyback program, even better because they're defending their stock. All right, buddy. So I hope that answers your question. Uh, anyone else? Any other questions? Justice, uh, when does one exit a stock position? That's a good question, Justice. Uh, uh, Justice, that's a really good question. Well, look, the short answer to that, it's an art. It's not an exact science. So you do your analysis the way I shared you right here, okay? As soon as the stock hits your price target, maybe take half of the table. Let it keep going up maybe another 10, 20, 30%, then take the other half. And you slowly, gradually take profits on the way to the upside. Very hard that someone's going to capture you know, the, the exact top. Um, professionals, we, we do not sell all at once, right? Again, go back to something like an Amazon, right? You're not going to be selling all, um, at, at, at the upside. There's other ways that I do it, um, from a technical standpoint, using Gartley patterns, using measured move. I'm not going to get into that in, in this session, but very simple, right? When a stock bounces of the 200 day moving average line after 12 and 24 months i can peel some off so from here it increased a little bit i'll take some off here from here it increased a little bit more i'll take some off here right so it could be art than more than science and not as technical but as a reference point if it hits your price target start peeling some off take 50 percent off take some money off the table and then as the stock continue to move up 20, 
Just keep taking off the table, keep taking off the table. So there's different ways of looking at this. Um, you know, there's something known as here, swing points, garlic pattern at my D point. That's another way that I would take profit, but I don't have time to go into this today. This is also very technical. It's a little bit more advanced, but that's another tool that I use to, to take profit. So I kind of, I hope that kind of gives you a little bit insight on, on how to do that as well. Okay. Uh, any other questions? Nope. All right. All right, folks. Well, I hope this was informative. I hope this gave you insight. I hope I've been able to give you some value. Take everything that you've learned today and apply it to your own stocks. If not, attend the next uh, stock that we're going to be analyzing and we're going to go through this process again. Um, and for those of you that want to learn more, check out our starter programs where you're going to get access to all of this information and, and, and some really good um, professional analyst training to, to develop your, your skill set and be part of our growing community. So I'll end it here. Thank you for your time and I'll see you guys in the next one. Take care.